Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast number 303. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Axon would like to give all the loyal listeners two great gifts. One is a free pair of work gloves. So if you're looking for those work gloves, send an email to marketing at axontire.com. And the other one is if you plan on attending the Moving Iron Summit coming up here in Nashville, Tennessee, September 11th through the 13th. Uh, that's in 23. So um, 11th through the 13th in Nashville. Check that out. Send me an email at Moving Iron Podcast at Moving Iron Podcast.com and use, uh, tell me that Axon Tire is going to pay for uh, $50 of your um, registration fee and I'll get that applied to you. So the first 150 people that take advantage of that get that $50 discount off of their registration fee. So check that out. Valid Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800 657 4910 for all your trucking needs at Valid Transportation. Our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy your ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. TractorZoom has access to over $20 billion in heavy equipment sales data. TractorZoom's Iron Comps is the industry's trusted solution for transparent equipment values and auctional pricing insights. And finally, this podcast is brought to you by Anvil AppWorks. Their dealer connects CRMI app with integrated inventory management is an affordable Salesforce-based solution for your dealership. Create connected customer experience and transform how you work today. All right, so I've got Rich Pawson on here, coming in, checking in for his monthly uh, recap of what's happening in the market uh, from the economic side of things. And uh, Rich is always a wealth of knowledge, and you and I sat around here for quite a while, Rich, trying to figure out what we were going to talk about because there's just not that much going on. So I don't, I don't know what we're going to talk about here <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> had, a, had a couple big things happen this week. You had, obviously, the November crop report came out. And basically, it's a Wall Street report, you know, so you're talking about ending stocks, what that looks like, kind of got an idea of where the overall market was based around um, the end of, you know, just some some harvest-related data came through, you know, what what's the final bushel per acre look like or going into the big January report. Um, so had that come out, and then probably more importantly, which really had a huge effect on the market, was the CPI report came out. So now I've seen a couple different uh, numbers float around, but... Somewhere between 8.2 and 8.4% last month was the report as the overall inflation for the year. And then when this report came out this month, it was down in that 7.8 range. Um, so we had a, had a decline um, for in in the uh, overall um, inflationary report for the year. And this is two months in a row, right, Rich? Yes. Down? Yep. Yes. And you kind of you kind of been talking about that, that you thought this November, December time frame would start seeing uh, a decline in the overall inflationary um, re uh, reports. And then how did we move into that first quarter that there'd be some leveling off, I guess, of, of what interest rates would look like. Now, this is something I'd like to have your opinion on. So um, Chairman Powell's talked quite a bit about interest rates. You now we're going to keep raising stuff, might do it again. In December, might not be a three quarters of a point, but it could be a half a point. You know, it could be a quarter point. They don't know yet. They're going to, have to wait and see what happens. But he's made it pretty clear that even if the uh, you know interest rates do come, or uh, inflationary report continues to come down, that they're going to maintain a higher interest rate right now and and maintain with that for a while. So, I guess read between the lines there, Rich. Are you are you seeing the same thing I'm seeing when that as far as what he's talking about, or or am I am I off base here? I think you're on base, uh, and yet we then have to not look at just what the Fed's doing with their rates, but what the free market wants to do. And we got a little bit different story, which I'll explain in a moment. Yes, in, uh, uh, in earlier this month, when the Fed Reserve came out and raised their rates by three quarters of a point, which was as expected, they made some interesting comments from the uh, press release from the FOMC meeting that they might actually do a policy change for the first time, I don't know, in many years, in the sense of swinging to looking at real-time data, the latest data, instead of old data. They'd like to lag. They want to follow a bigger trend. They're trend followers. They're not trend timers. And they kind of give 
as a clue that they might look at something more up to date. And that more up to date data was saying we might actually be winning on this inflation thing. And we could raise rates too high for too long and hurt our economy. And maybe we ought to back off a bit. So the market, the minute it saw that news, I was trading myself at that time and the price just exploded and it's, oh boy, we got it. This is great. <laughs> Then Powell comes out a few minutes to do his speech and answering questions. And he basically said the exact opposite. <laughs> he come out with guns blazing, saying, you know, we're going to slam these rates higher for a long time to come. We're going to kill this inflation. And he literally said, if we have to kill the economy, we'll do it. Because he also said, if we have to, we'll just print money and rebuild it. So stock market then collapsed and come down. <laughs> I shouldn't say collapsed, but it was a nice down move mm -hmm. for a few days there. And that kind of threw me off a little bit because I was so pleased to see uh, that Fed information that they might get on board with uh, looking a little more detailed, more up-to-date uh, information. I'm going to take those that press release for its uh, word that um, they're going to look at this uh, going forward. And I think we'll see quarter to 50 point rises in the future. That doesn't mean they won't do one more three quarters point hike here in December. But I think after that, it's quarter to a half. I think uh, originally they were looking for four and a half, a little higher. They may now be looking for as much as 5% on the rate. I think they can do that, but I think they're going to be over and done with early next year. Some people are already saying this December hike will be it. They're going to be over and done with. Now, when we say over and done with, I don't think it's coming down for a long time. I think Powell will say, hey, I want that inflation coming down a huge amount. Okay, And, and so I think they level off by early next year maybe as soon as December, but I say early next year. And the free market rate is going to pick up on that and actually be less than the Fed rate at times. And I could see the Fed maybe just leaving rates sideways for all of next year even. And that does not bother me. Um, I just don't want the free market rates to continue to go higher next year because eventually that will break something. And to me, in the last few weeks and at different times throughout this year, I could sense the bond market was saying, we don't need to take as high as everybody thinks. And why would we destroy the economy just because of beating up on inflation? So the bond market doesn't want to do it. And I think we're very, very close um, to the bond market having this attitude is it'll go up if the Fed goes up, but it's not going to go up ahead of the Fed and speculate where the Fed's going. It wants to be dragged higher. And when you go back to study history in the last 20 years of how the free market related to the Fed, oftentimes when the Fed stopped raising rates, yes, the free market rate rolled over and came below the Fed. Then later, the Fed lowered its rates as if trying to catch up with the free market. So I think the bond market is uh, this week, oh, beautiful collapse. My model is right. It was saying, gosh, rates ought to go down after this inflation report. And I thought, man, that's a clue. We're going to get, we're going to do something good here in the inflation rate. But I didn't know how, I didn't dare make that forecast because everybody's had a difficult time right. uh, for forecasting this rollover in inflation. But it just looked like it's time for the interest rates to go down, bond prices to go up. Well, this week they just panicked, bought, and it was mostly yesterday, bought bonds. And when you buy bonds, the price of bonds go up and the interest rate comes down. And they have hammered interest rates this week. I really like it. They've wiped out six weeks of increases in interest rates. Now, the problem is even the model saying that a long-term top in interest rates isn't due to early next year. That aligns with what most people are betting the Fed will do. So I think the Fed may continue to raise in early next year and then stop. We may see the interest rates, even though they're down a lot this week, they may have to recover some going into early next year, then down for something better on the downside. So I'm not saying they won't go back up. In fact, I think in just the next two weeks, we'll learn they did bounce back. But I'm kind of hopeful there's a little more uh, downside than this even next few days here, at least, on this interest rate. Uh, so the next question is, well, why did people panic to, to buy bonds? Well, the answer is they're used to buying bonds and only getting a tenth of a percent to 1% interest rate. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at interest rates of four all the way up to anybody who could write a mortgage for someone, they can get seven or 8%. So they're thinking, well, if we are close to a top, then why wouldn't we lock in these interest rates? So I, I think at least the professional Wall Streeters and the rich who own most of the bonds, just as they own most of the stock market, I think they said, yeah, 
we want some we we want some of this four or five percent or four percent ten year treasury note uh, interest rate is what they said, yeah. and um, so yeah, that's my best forecast. Yeah, the Fed will probably raise some more, but I think we're we're getting close to a peak for the Fed. I think it's possible, even though the peak should not occur for free market rates early next year. I'm a little suspicious; it may not go much higher than what we've already seen this year. It's going to drag its feet. So the next question is. Well, why did all this occur? Well, it's the inflation report that came out this week. Uh, as soon as that report was released, bam, they were buying bonds, okay? Now, um, what occurred with inflation? Well, you know, we've had 8.2, 8.4, as you alluded to, and uh, in recent weeks, maybe months, I've been telling my subscribers, I really want a 7.8% CPI headline inflation. And... Uh, I, you know, I, it may be nervous. How am I going to forecast that? But I just said, boy, if you just give me that, I think we've done a, a rollover enough of inflation that we just need to gamble on the idea that it's just going lower for the next 12 months. And I just warned people uh, a few days ago, last week, and then minutes before they released the report, I warned them this stock market is set up to bounce. I think that means a good inflation report finally. And I just said, boy, give me that 7.8. This market ought to shoot higher. Well, they came in at 7.8, okay? And uh, shocked that they came in at my number. And no, I wasn't a genius saying that's where I'll go. I just said, someday it's going there. And I just wanted to see it. And uh, there it was. And it's in print, it's done. It's history now. And the stock market uh, soared off from that. But where are we going for inflation? I think uh, it's going to continue to erode throughout next year. I think eventually it gets back to 3%, or maybe even Powell's 2%, uh, Fed's 2%. But I um, I just uh, I think something's changed and will stay there for the rest of this decade. Then I think it's going to be very difficult to get it to actually 2% or lower. Um, if it's going below 2%, I'd be more concerned. We've got a problem in the economy. It's going to go negative and we're going to have a recession. <laughs> um, I think the Fed, just as they had problems trying to get inflation up to 2%, they're going to have problems getting it down to 2%. But I will say that I think this year, or I should say next year, towards the end of next year, we may see it down to uh, 3%. Now, I don't think it's going to be a nonstop decline inflation. We will get some bounces along the way on the way down. Um, some headwinds, some scary moments maybe, and that can upset the financial markets and possibly commodities at times. But uh, I think this looks good. I think we're on our way to lower inflation. And, and then uh, let's, let's kind of switch over to the economy. What, what does this all imply in the economy? And I think, yes, the first half of the year GDP was minus. That was a definition of a recession. But my modeling says we really weren't in a recession. It was just a weird moment that GDP kind of miscalculated here of really catching on what's going on. And we have seen this back in the 70s with high inflation where you could have a recession by some indicators, but by other indicators, it was not. The, the economy is still. So we're in this fuzzy world here where we'll be debating and even fighting uh, for a few years now. Of where are we in a recession and all this business? But um I like the PMI indicator that normally runs a positive correlation to the GDP. They go up and down together. And I will say it's a weird time. The PMI has been going down even as of October. It went to the lowest for the year. My model correctly forecasts that we would see some economy problems this year and a lower stock market this year. And But why is the PMI going down when for the third quarter of this year, GDP shot up? It's up 2.6% when it had been minus nine and then minus 0.6 or 0.3 or something. And previously minus 0.9 actually. Uh, the 2.6 was higher than expected, better, but it was in the direction and the time. And so the model gets a gold star. We were right. Uh, it is stronger than I expected. It may have to back off, chill out a little bit here in the future. It is a little hard to explain why the PMI hasn't turned up yet, but I had warned the model was saying it might not bottom until as late as October. I can even allow a couple more months on my personal stuff outside of the modeling. Um, I, my guess in a few months, we'll see the PMI turned up as well. Right the moment, PMI is back to near 50, suggesting economy is stalling 
out. It's not really falling backwards or contracting. It may be, and we may learn that in the November report for PMI. But I think ultimately in the next few months, we'll see that PMI turn up, get in line with GDP. And my forecast has been all along that, yeah, we'll have a setback this year, but GDP will be doing better next two years. PMIs do better. The economy will do better. But the good news is inflation will be coming down during that time. And I think that's going to make for a calmer consumer, business person. And I think it's an outright bullish scenario uh, for the stock market. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I was very pleased. This is one of the best weeks I've seen in a while for the data and the type of bottling I do. I'm, I'm ecstatic this week. Uh, of course, I'm also on the right side of the stock market, but, I, but I, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with this. I'm not <clears> saying we're not going to have headwinds and shocks, but right at the moment, in my opinion, I don't buy into the inversion and the interest rate market forecasting of recession. I think that's going to go away. It's not going to work. If I'm wrong on that, we're still going to be in this fuzzy time for several months of some things saying we're going to recession, other things saying we're doing better than ever. Ultimately, my model adds that up that we're still going to have a, a higher stock market. Um, the election was supposed to, in history, taught us to favor the Republicans, and the model was okay with that. But the election is, uh, the model actually likes a little better in the sense we're not rocking the boat here too much. And I think that just means, yes, we're going to grow the economy and, and the stock market's going higher. So, um, yeah, very, very good week. Even minutes before the report, I just said, gosh, it looks like uh, we may finally get this good report and the stock market's going to soar. And um, as far as my stock market forecast, I think uh, the S&P is, what, over 3,900 now? Yeah, it can dip today, ought to be up some more to next week. It might run into trouble around 4,000, but um, I think looking out to the end of the year, even though there could be some big setbacks along the way, according to the model, I think it's ultimately moving higher. We may even get a Santa Claus rally to finish the year off with a nice moment. We may yet see 41, 4,200 in the S&P 500. And I think in the next two years, uh, I think we could see 5,300 to 57, maybe 5,900 here. No, you know, nice, maybe 40% up in the next couple of years uh, in the stock market. But but where will I get nervous? Well, unfortunately, I can't get nervous unless it takes out the low of this year uh, in the stock market. And that was in October. And the model a few days after that bottom, I kind of thought it was going lower in November, but just a few days after that bottom in October, the model jumped on it nicely and just said, you you got to call another bottom here. You just got to take another shot at it. And uh and then this week, it also said a short-term bottom should occur, which suggested we were going to get some good news. We got it. So we can always be wrong, but um, until it takes out the low of this year, and over time, hopefully, I can come up with a higher price than that to warn us that we've got some problems. Right at the moment, I am stuck with using the lowest price of the year as our danger point, risk point. And other than that, I've got to uh, be long-term bullish. And I uh, think that we have some optimism coming here and that people are going to calm down next year and kind of get back to a little normal, normal economy here. So, you know, people ask me, well, yeah, but what could really destroy this? You know, and I think it's going to have to take something huge, uh, World War Three or something. <laughs> to, I, I really do think we got a rock solid uh, <clears throat> bottom in here. And, uh, so how do you think, how do you think China plays in all this? If they, you know, you got to get a, take everything they used to take with a grain of salt. But, you know, if you start looking at, they start easing some of these COVID shutdown restrictions and those kind of things that they've got in play right now, they start moving those things around a little bit and they start to open up the country more on a regular basis. And, you know, manufacturing gets back in line and goods going in and out of the country make a lot of sense. H how do you think that plays into the whole inflationary thing? Cause that's got to have a huge impact on that. Yes. If they could just get past their COVID, um, these lockdowns or regional lockdowns, um, their manufacturers are going to prove they're, they're hurting the economy. We just got some recent information. Things are really uh, slipping. Okay. They're, uh, people are buying less from China, but they're also producing less. And it's just kind of backfiring there on the lockdown. And we all know, yes, lockdowns backfire. I mean, we did it and we had some problems. Um, but I, you know, I'm not going to argue with them whether they should be doing it or not. They have to take care of their people the way they see best. And um, 
But I think with any luck at all, by this spring going into summer, we're going to see some evidence they're backing off on that. And I think that improves manufacturing and proves, uh, helps improve the global economy. Right at the moment, it is a headwind, mm-hmm. but it's not, I don't think it's a negative factor. Some economists might argue it is because the China economy, hey, what their second biggest in the world, it, it right. makes an impact. But I think, uh, I think we're going to see improvement later this year. I think the stock market even does better this year. Um, but I don't want to paint a rosy picture in the sense that I do believe the world and especially the U S is really on this idea that we have to be more fair of trade here and our relations. So I think we've seen the easiest, perhaps even largest, best business with China has peaked for quite some time. That's not a negative. I'm not using that as saying, oh, eventually all the economies fall apart. And no, I don't see that at all. It's going to be good business. It will improve from here eventually. But I do think we've seen the big rush. Uh, you know, it's been a gold rush since 1980s, believe it or not, uh, to do business with China. Now we're moving beyond that. We're saying, who else do we do business with? And hey, how about doing some of our own business, produce for, produce for ourselves, right? And too many of our businesses gave away too many of our jobs. That's all there is to it. Mm-hmm. And so we're correcting that and we're seeing evidence in that in our own manufacturing that, yes, I think that's going to keep inflation from going as low as it used to. But the good news is it's going to keep employment low and it's going to keep the pay up. Uh, but it's possibly also going to keep inflation a little bit elevated, a little bit buoyant there. And I'm all good with that because I think quite a few Americans will be a little bit happier that we get some of these jobs back and produce a little more for itself. And there's many other countries on the same page. And China knows this, and I think they're trying to to deal with it and work the best they can, but they are going to come out and fight at moments too because nobody likes to lose business that you've gained right. <laughs> over the you know. Yeah. And, but, I, but I think they're smart enough. In other words, internally, they're saying, hey, we have to adjust to this and go along with the world. Externally, when they step up to talk to us, they're going to say, well, you can't do that to us. But they know we all got to adjust. Yep. So I think it's optimistic down the road. But uh, yes, um, you're right to point out some of these issues right now have been a negative thing on the, on the overall global and U.S. economy here, which also brings this interesting thing on the dollar. The dollar got hammered this week as well. And I've had, what, two shots this year trying to call a long-term top. Looks like the second one's working. Um, I've been thinking the lower dollar next year. I don't want to get the commodity people excited. That means higher commodities. It may. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to people think, oh, inflation is going to return with lower dollar. I don't think so. You've got to bring the dollar down a huge amount from here. And we've rallied that dollar so much. It's unbelievable. It did go higher than I thought. But time-wise, it did it when I thought it would. So I get one gold star, not two. <laughs> but uh, but I, uh, at any rate, um, I like this price action in the dollar index. I don't study individual currencies much anymore, so I can't be helpful there. But I do think um, I think we got a chance the dollar has uh, peaked. It, it will bounce from time to time. It may bounce well going in early next year along with interest rates. If interest rates surge, dollar's going up. But I don't think, I think we're getting over that. And to me, if we can lower the dollar, it's going to not only help the global economy, but it's going to help our economy in a sense it's going to help our exports. And we're way behind. We're, you know, and our grain exports aren't doing good. <clears throat> now, some of that's not the dollar and the grain. Some of that is uh, China doesn't want to buy from us. So, <laughs> right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, we are seeing that more and more right now where there's we are seeing some tensions between the United States and China and there's there. there all the stuff that's moving there and, and the way they're acting and everything. You look what's happening in Brazil. They're on track to have a record crop, just ample, ample size. So, I mean, looking at what you saw come through on that November report, um, I guess what's your reaction to that? And how do you think that's going to affect the overall marketplace? Such as like ending stocks for grains. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to acknowledge, I think for the U S we would still call it a tight balance sheet. Um, anything that goes wrong in the supply side, prices ought to go up. But I look at the bright prices right today relative to our exports, to global economy, to our economy, to where I think the overall economy is going. I feel like the price is kind of high enough to temper a little bit of a supply cutback. So I don't want to get too carried away with the idea we have tight supplies. 
Um, I think we have to be concerned of a cyclical crop problem, weather problem uh, next year and the following year. And I don't know which year it'll be, and it could even be two years, so some kind of combination. As long as La Nina sticks uh, into next spring here, the U.S. is probably going to have lower yield than what we had this year. And to me, with this tight balance sheet, unless we lose some demand or find some more grain somewhere, I think uh, you know that could be quite a bull run uh, next summer. But the problem is, if La Nina goes away, the crop problem can delay to 2024. We can actually have a down year in grain prices because, if, especially if it goes to El Nino climate, uh, we're going to have uh, probably very good yields, good production. And I think we're going to have good plantings, even with the higher input costs. I think we're going to have some, you know, there's that potential to recover production quite a bit next year. But the key is, is whether or not we'll get a, a weather problem next year. And I'm kind of stuck in the middle I, to to play it safe, so to speak. Um, I will err on the side that we're probably going to get the crop problem next year. But it's it's really iffy. You can just see it go either way. We can have a good crop, not a good crop. I don't think we're going to have an extremely poor crop by no means. It's not going to be a 2012 scenario, in my opinion. So I don't think it's going to be an explosive run if if we get it next year. And if it delays to 2024 and we rebuild our supplies next year, then it also won't be so bullish for 2024. So a lot can go right or wrong for bulls and bears here in the next two years. It's going to be very, very interesting. I really need to get this weather issue out of the way because looking out to mid to late decade, I say a lot of these commodities will be lower price and things are going to uh, calm down on us. Now, where are we with weather today, such as South America? Because now they're up. Uh, they're on the... Uh, at the home plate, ready to uh, swing the bat here. Um, yes, there's issues in Argentina. Wheat production's down. Um, Argentina always has problems every year anyways, in my opinion. So it's difficult to say, do, do we really want to get bulled up on that? And um, But I look at Brazil, look at South America in general. I'm not really seeing the weather issues here. But hey, this is a time it can happen from now into February. So we got to watch out for that. And I think that's why the U.S. grain prices haven't come down as much as they should have relative to our exports and what's been going on in the economy is people are saying, do we really want to sell this? Uh, we ought to see how South America is doing. And best I could tell, South America is planning, uh, planning a lot, producing a lot, if they can get the weather. And the La Nina is still here from what I understand. So it could be an issue for South America. But I kind of feel like Brazil might be trying to change, swing the other way a little bit of uh, not such a problem. Um, so anyways, like I said, I, I guess I view the the tightness, the ending stocks, the USDA report telling us, let's not get bared down in the sense of expecting a huge price decline at least the next few months. I don't see that, but I am bearish. And it's been a struggle. I've been waiting patiently and I'm profitable right now off of that analysis. It's working for me, but I don't really see a big down move here. And um and I do see after January 1, we have to consider how about that seasonal tendency to move higher, especially when we have these kind of balance sheets. And what about our own weather here in the U.S. or even the entire Northern Hemisphere next summer, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I am bearish, but I just, on the grains, but I just, um, it's more of a trader's thing. It's just time to make a little money on the downside here. Right. I don't, I don't, uh, I've had, if we're having a major decline, I'm afraid I got to wait quite a while to see some kind of evidence we can grow a good crop next year. Right on. Okay. All right. Let's jump over one last topic here and let's talk about what we see happen over in the energy market right now. So, price of oil had a pretty good run up this week. Um, you know, I can see where things kind of kind of went and things have done uh, various things throughout the week, but but really oil has done quite well. Um, still taking oil out of the strategic petroleum reserve as fast they can doing all the stuff they see there um i guess as you look at what's going on there and then just your opinion on you know i think they set that buyback market like 70 bucks or something like that to to go back in on the on the petroleum uh strategic petroleum reserve to replenish all the stuff they've taken out looking at what's going on right now rich do you really see the ability to get to that $70 mark. And, and I guess what is your long-term view on oil price of oil right now going into uh, the winter months here where we're going to see some, some need for heating oil and those kind of things. Yeah. I think as far as the $70, uh, I think the government did a, a fine job figuring out the price level where they ought to buy it and wouldn't create too much demand to put prices up too high. I think they're right that uh, even if they don't get it bought, the point is it can 
uh, help oil companies kind of move forward to, to drilling more. Uh, now, will they get it bought at $70? I don't think so from now into uh, summer. I would like to think it could go near that low. And I am bearish for a few weeks here, but it's getting late enough that we have to assume gasoline any anywhere from October into February normally bottoms, starts moving higher into May. And the interesting thing is, at least on the futures market, and actually be going down during summer, even though it's still going higher at the pump, or at least it levels off at the pump. Um, I, you know, we'll have good enough seasonal demand here to support the gasoline market in the summer. Oil can be off. It doesn't have to stay right in line with gasoline. I've seen it go down for an entire month when gasoline went higher. Uh, but when looking over two or three months, normally oil will do about the same as gasoline. So I'm assuming looking out to summer, oil will be higher as well. So I really question whether the government gets a chance at 70 bucks. I do think looking all the way out to 2025, 2026, they will have an opportunity to do it. And I don't see... Uh, barring a World War III or something, I don't see the kind of disasters over the next four or five years here where um, we wished we, we replenished our supply sooner. So I think we should just be patient and we'll get that rebuilt over the next few years. But anyone wanting to get it built now, I think they're not going to get that price low enough. Even though I'm bearish oil the next few weeks, I like I say, I'm, I'm kind of thinking as the further out we go, we're going to get a rebound in oil. I don't think we're going to see a rebound in oil back to the high of this year, last year, whatever is the highest. Um, I, I just don't see that kind of disaster. I see the world kind of settling it out, calming down here in the next couple of years here. Um, I realize there's probably still some mega bulls out there, but Goldman Sachs have been one of the biggest mega bulls. Maybe they flipped on me. I haven't followed them probably a month or two here, but uh, probably two months ago, I think I saw a forecast where they were giving up on the idea of uh, maybe 140 oil or something even higher than that or something. And I think the record high in the future is 147. Um, I think it's it's going to be difficult to sustain it above $100 here for any length of period of time, frankly, but we can revisit $100 easy enough or not that far below it. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's my stance on uh, oil here. Yep. All right. Get your reaction to this a little bit here, and then we'll we'll close it down. The whole FTX implosion uh, and what that did um, for for cryptos, and then what does like what kind of ripple effect do you think that sends across the the overall market right now? Because that's a, there was quite a bit of of yeah. money there that just kind of evaporated <laughs> over, over a eleven month period. Yeah, so. somebody said in the last year two trillion dollars was yeah. wiped out of uh, crypto. Uh, I turned bearish. Uh, Basically, Bitcoin, I don't necessarily follow all of the crypto. I kind of use Bitcoin as a clue of the entire crypto. And that might not be a correct thing, but uh, I turned bearish Bitcoin in December. It was bearish all the way up to no uh, till November 3rd. And then I said, I think we got a long-term bottom. And I told everybody I was going to be bearish in early next year. And I called a bottom and it was feeling right for a couple of days. <laughs> And then, <laughs> then FTX comes out <laughs> and big crashes. And I said, well, folks, I'm bearish. <laughs> and okay. That's all I can tell Bottom. you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I feel as though I should stick with the original forecast, just be bearish right in early next year. But I'm concerned that uh, Bitcoin is might have a better solid background and some of these other cryptos and some of them crashed and burn and may go away forever and all that business. But I, I wouldn't be surprised at bottoms now, but I think yeah. we're a few weeks away from that kind of bottom. And what I'm doing as a backup is I've just told my subscribers, if it goes, if Bitcoin goes above the high of this week, I'm willing to jump back on board for a long-term bottom. In the meantime, uh, be concerned for all I know, it can crash much more because for many years, I said it ought to go below 20,000, maybe back to 10. And what were we, 17, 18 or something like that? And somebody yeah. saying... You know, there's some people out there saying 10,000 would be the better level. Somebody said that was cost of production, um, which I don't have much experience dealing with that. <laughs> um, but so it can go much lower uh, still here and it could stay down much longer. But yeah, if it takes out this week's high with any convincing behavior, um, I don't doubt looking out the next year and the following year, Bitcoin does better and maybe the overall crypto will do better. I think the only reason to do that is people are just washed out. They're just not willing to sell anymore, any lower. And then later, 
Bitcoin wakes up that, you know, the economy's okay, the country's okay, the stock market's going ahead, okay. And there will be people who, who will be diehard die lovers of it, but they're also making money in the stock market and they'll take some profits out just to put back into Bitcoin and these other currencies, just as a diversification for investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think it can rebound in a, in a couple of years here. I still believe it's probably something that's going to hang around forever, the, at least the technology part of it. But you're going to see uh, more discussion of it's time to regulate it. And that may actually make it better for it as an actual currency, but it'll probably tame it down so it's not this uh, wonderful speculative tool that a lot of people have made a lot of money out of uh, on both sides and stuff like that. But yes, major crash and burn. And yeah, uh, fastest give up on a long-term bottom call I made <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> so. Do you think more people are going to, because of this, you're gonna, would you suspect to see money flow over to precious metals like gold and silver? Oh, I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing that. And I don't study silver anymore, but I have a few people that I, I don't know, every couple of months I take a look to see what they're doing. And uh, they were already liking silver anyways. And now because of this, they like it more. And my gut feeling is they can be right on that. But again, I, I don't study it. I don't have a forecast on it. Uh, gold, I'm a long-term bear gold into 2025, but I've warned my subscribers, this can be one of the weirdest, sloppiest bear markets. I even though it could go all the way down to 1400, 1500, I would say with this uh, Bitcoin or um, the FTX development, they're, they're buying gold. And I, I've warned people, we could have $100, $150 rallies in gold, even in still in a bear market. It might even be just sideways all the way into 2025. The better statement from what I'm getting from this modeling <clears throat> is that it should be difficult to go to a new record high, that, that the current record high is so important that it just should not go above it over the next four or five years. And uh, so I don't want to scare people or just disappoint the gold bugs. We, we can have some rallies here. We can have some support. And I'm willing to bet some of these Wall Streeters are saying, I can't trust, uh, even though gold was not a worthy investment last two years, horrible hedge for inflation. They're saying, yeah, but it also has a history of being far more stable and safer than, right. than the cryptocurrencies. Yep. So, yeah, I think that can uh, what occurred here can support gold for for a while here. I still want to be bearish, but I've already warned it. It may not be all that great a bear market. It's just I got to make the call anyways. <laughs> right. So. right on. All right. Uh, Rich, good stuff, man. Um, talk a little bit about your podcast, what you have going on over, over there and, and where people can find it. Yes. Uh, so go to criticalpointpod.com. And you'll find uh, various pages discussing myself, a little blog section, which I hadn't updated in months. And I'm finally uh, going to get more uh, disciplined here to put some more freaking stuff on it. You'll find a page to take you to our video audio podcast host site uh, where you can see free and subscription. You can log in at that page or on any of the, uh, or I should say subscribe on any of those videos, but there's also a subscription page right on the homepage of criticalpointpod.com. I produce a morning brief uh, on the stock market and then a separate one in grains. And then I do uh, at least uh, one video during the week that's just kind of an update. And then I do a weekly updates, normally on Thursdays. One is financial markets, economy, stock market stuff, uh, gold, crude oil. And then another one is grains. And then on the stock market side, at least one of those weekly updates is a monthly update where we get into vault and more long term. What I create are a variety of buy and sell signals from, uh, say, a month all the way out to years. And I even have a once a decade sell signal that history shows the stock market drops 20 to 50 percent, believe it or not. And I have once a decade buy signal along the way during that bull market during a decade and the economic growth during a decade. We have many other types of buy sell signals to model label all price fluctuation from one minute up to years, believe it or not. We label it and it gives us an idea of how long it will go up, how long will it go down. It gives us a clue of when is bad news going to occur, but it can't necessarily give us that precise newspaper story a day before the newspaper is printed or anything. It just gives us a guideline of, hey, it's time for bad news or, hey, it's time for good news. 
that's very valuable information. It does pretty good at that. We can't get all the twists and turns accurate in terms of a timing point of view, uh, but we run some high rate of accuracy and people just find it very valuable. Even if they tell me they're a long-term investor, they love to hear this stuff, at least on a weekly basis, to tell them why is the market twisting and turning within their long-term uh, investment kind of perspective, okay? Um, people can also reach me at uh, on Twitter at rich underscore Posson, that's P-O-S-S-O-N, and they can email me at rich at ag-financial.com. Right on. So, Check him out on Twitter, man. There's a lot of good stuff there. And go go to the go to the Podbean thing. There's like Rich was saying, like there's there's a lot of stuff there for free that you can that you can listen to and quick little tidbits. And there's lots of great information in there and the service is well worth the money. So make sure you guys check all that out. And uh Rich is uh an incredible amount of information uh in in what he's got going on and in very um the one thing I like about you, Rich, is that you're you're uh not that this is a uh a trait that I want to see in everybody, but you're, you're have a contrarian view to what's going on uh, around you. And, and typically the contrarian view is, uh, is a little more accurate than what you hear on the talking heads on TV. So thanks for what you're doing out there, Rich. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC out or on um, LinkedIn at Moving Iron podcast and you can see the video version of this at the moving iron podcast youtube channel which that's the name of it you use up all my brain cells to think of that one so check that one out when you uh, get a minute anything moving iron related go to moving iron llc.com you can find all the information there for anything that's going on blog posts of the library of the moving iron podcast as well as information from the moving iron summit i should have some information up here this weekend uh to have more information about what's going on there so with that I am Casey Seymour with Rich Possum. Let's move some iron, folks. Out. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here.